Well, Mr. President, Director General, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight to address businesses who represent so much of what is great about our country. And having listened to Sir Roger's speech, I absolutely applaud and agree with the clear truths, the hard truths that he spelt out. And I thank him for the tributes paid to the change taking place in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office on which I wish to expand. And he spoke a little about the, happy, the unhappy public or uh, tests of uh, public popularity. Of course, we had local elections uh, 10 days ago. And in my party, there was only one thing really particularly to be happy about, uh, which was Boris was re-elected as mayor of London uh, here. And um, it reminded me of the first time I ever went to campaign for him when he was a candidate in the unlikely place of Clwyd South in North Wales. Uh, and in 1997, and he and I, for electoral purposes, were put on the Flangothlan uh, steam train in the cab. Uh, and we were waving at the cameras, and then we realized we were alone in the cab. And we did not know how to, we did not know how to slow down a steam train <laughs> accelerating on the Flangothlan railway. Somebody came to rescue us, and then I said to Boris, uh, so how's it going then, Boris? And he said, well, it's going to be huge. And uh, I said, well, what's going to be huge? He said, I don't know, but it's going. <laughs> to be huge, um, and it was. In this case, the swing to Labour was huge uh, in, in 1997. And ever since then, at the start of the election, Boris and I say to each other, it's going to be huge. Um, and he, um, he uh, when it was, um, when it was, when we were all being asked a few years ago uh, who had taken drugs at university, and it was written in the Daily Telegraph that Boris had never taken drugs at university, he responded, this is an outrageous slur. <laughs> he said, um, <laughs> he said, there are no no-go areas as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and nobody asked him about it ever again. <laughs> and clearly this is the way we should all behave, but maybe we wouldn't all get away with it, and I hope that just as there are no no-go areas for him, that um, for you and me in promoting British business overseas, there are very few no-go areas in the years ahead. And as Foreign Secretary and a member of the Cabinet, I see every week, every day, how the domestic economic scene and the international scene comes together. I see how it's crucially important that investors overseas have confidence in Britain as a place to base their business how it's vital that we have embassies around the world that are able to champion Britain and help create a stable and open international environment in which our country can thrive. And this is why foreign policy has to support jobs and growth and prosperity. Some people have sneered at this since I started arguing it. They fail to grasp that we have to help enterprising people create the wealth that drives the investment in our schools, our hospitals, our roads, that pays for our overseas development programs. And of course, our foreign policy has to achieve other things too. We work on those every day. Uh, support for human rights is in our core national interest and deep in our DNA as a, as a nation. Uh, uh, this is crucially important too. But our ability to promote freedom and democracy is strengthened by a strong economy and a global role. Foreign policy is not something that exists in a vacuum. It is not window dressing for our nation overseas. It is not the plaything or pastime of ministers to be channeled into utopian schemes to remake the world. And it is not merely a rapid reaction capability, putting out fires when crises erupt around the world. It must be, and with this government it is, a coherent plan for how we secure our country's long-term interests in a more competitive and unpredictable world. We face formidable challenges in foreign affairs, from nuclear proliferation to climate change to international terrorism, and we fight all those dangers every day. But the greatest single danger to our country today is economic in nature. I led one side of the negotiations that produced the coalition government. And the atmosphere in those negotiations was urgent. We knew that our country needed a stable government able to make tough calls at a time of unprecedented economic risk. And two years on, we have taken many of those difficult decisions. When we came to office, the deficit stood at 11% of GDP. It's now forecast to, seven, to fall to 7.6% next year. This has delivered lower borrowing costs for government, households, and businesses 
Sterling gilt rates are at their lowest since the year 1703 at the moment. Our economy, for, that, for those purposes, is seen as a safe haven in Europe, and we've begun domestic reforms to create the conditions for growth and competitiveness. But the sense of urgency and purpose has to be with us still. We are still grappling with the effects of the worst economic crisis to hit our country and the world in living memory. The economic recovery has been slower and more uneven than expected, including in Britain. Global growth has been weaker than predicted, and there is still instability in the global financial system. The Eurozone is facing profound challenges, many of which, in my opinion, were obvious from the beginning, but which are now exacerbated by weak growth and excessive debt. Commodity price shocks are leading to rising costs and dampening recovery. And we're starting to see creeping fingers of protectionism in parts of the world, picking at the edges of the free and open markets on which the international economy depends. This is what we're up against as a country. No single event would provide a bigger boost to the British economy in the short term than the resolution of the Eurozone crisis and a return to growth in Europe. And the crucial ingredients of achieving that growth are fewer barriers to business, more free trade, less intrusive regulation, and the understanding that governments have never and will never create wealth solely through their own activities. But we won't put Britain back on the path to prosperity unless we deal with our own economy's deep underlying problems. And this is the driving purpose of our government. We have to rebalance our economy and deal with the legacy of national debt on a colossal scale. We have to boost economic confidence and attract investment, break into new markets and re reduce our trade deficit. We have to rise to the challenge of earning our living in the world, where indeed many British businesses are leading the way. We have to recognize that our graduates are now competing in a global marketplace against well-schooled, ambitious, and dynamic young people in burgeoning new markets around the world. It is different from the environment when most of us left university and entered the world of work. We have to win our place in this world economy. And I argue to set out to want success more than some of our competitors. And as I wrote in the Times this morning, that is directed to every civil servant, entrepreneur, shopkeeper, trader, investor, student, and minister. The challenge for all our countries is, for all countries, is to adapt and thrive or fail to change and fall behind. Now, some nations will succeed in doing this, and some, I think, may not. Our government is determined that our country will be one that does succeed. And that is why we're reducing the deficit and bringing public finances under control, creating a tax system that fosters growth and is attractive to business, reducing corporation tax to among the lowest in the G20, and lifting two million people out of income tax altogether, introducing a welfare system that encourages people into work, and an education system that gives people the skills they need to succeed. By doing these things, we are turning around the fortunes of our economy for the long term. And it's my firm belief that in the 2020s, these reforms, particularly in education and in welfare, will be seen as having been as important to our country as the trade union reforms and privatizations of the 1980s. My objective in leading the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is to ensure that when these domestic reforms take effect and the benefits are seen, the British people will also find that we have developed vital new networks and connections overseas so that they can make the most of the opportunities open to them. On top of preventing conflict, promoting our values, and dealing with crises, this is the vital role of the Foreign Office. It must support open and fair markets, resist protectionism, battle bribery and corruption, and take the lead in protecting the intellectual property on which must much of our trade advantage is based. Our diplomats have to help create new openings for British business overseas and for inward investment, and in the European Union, champion growth, business-friendly regulation, the expansion of the single market, and the free trade agreements that bring billions of pounds worth of business into our economy. All of us know that sustainable growth in our economy is not going to come from government spending fueled by debt or, in current circumstances, from domestic consumer demand. 
It is going to come from investment and from boosting the share of our economy that comes from exports. Our economic achievements have always been built on our prowess as a trading nation. The openness, inventiveness, and daring hardwired into our national DNA helps explain why it is that we are still the seventh largest economy and the sixth largest trading nation in the world when we only make up 1% of its population. We export around 30% of our GDP. We have immense advantages of language, history, and geography. And British ideas and technologies are changing the world. You know about them. In Manchester, Nobel Prize-winning scientists are developing graphene, the new wonder material that is one carbon atom thick. In Cambridge, ARM are designing the technology that goes into 90% of all smartphones. And in London, scientists from UCL and Imperial College are researching ways to use nanotechnology to tackle cancer or to generate cheap solar energy. It is achievements like these that undoubtedly will fuel our future success. But we have to be even better at deploying them in the future than we have been in recent years. We've actually lost global export market share over the last decade and fallen behind our European competitors in emerging economies. Our trade with Brazil, a country of almost 200 million people, is half our trade with Denmark. And the number of SMEs exporting in this country is below the European average. Today, the vast majority of our exports head to markets which will remain vitally important to us, but where growth is currently sluggish. 70% of all our exports go to North America, the EU, Japan, and Switzerland. And less than 10% are destined for the 10 largest emerging economies. Now, long-term economic predictions are often wrong in their detail. But on current trends, emerging markets and developing countries will account for about 60% of global GDP by the middle of the next decade. And in the first half of this century, the BRICS, already larger than the Eurozone, could overtake the G7. So we have to tap into new markets as well as retaining our strong position in the old, particularly in the vital markets of the United States and the European Union. This is a challenge that we can embrace with enthusiasm. Over the next 15 years, the world economy is projected to double from $60 trillion to $120 trillion. That's $60 trillion of new prosperity within a generation. And of course, we want British people to share in it. So the first task of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office when it comes to supporting our economy is to build the relationships that help British business expand market share in the fastest growing economies. The Chancellor has set the ambition of doubling UK exports to a trillion pounds a year by 2020, and the Prime Minister has called for us to help get another 100,000 companies exporting by 2020. If we can increase the number of firms exporting by 100,000, we can generate an extra 30 billion pounds a year for the British economy. Lord Green, in his capacity as Trade Minister, is bringing energy and determination to this task, working closely, as you know, with the CBI. We hope to see more initiatives, like the joint government CBI trade mission to Turkey last month that he led with John Cridland, the first of its kind for mid-sized businesses. And in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, we have a much sharper commercial focus, a reinforced economics unit, more staff seconded to business, a charter for business, and a leaner and more focused set of objectives. The foreign office I inherited had 10 objectives. Anyone in business knows that it's impossible for a workforce to be effective if there are more objectives than they can remember. So now we have three objectives, safeguarding Britain's national security, supporting British nationals overseas, and building our country's prosperity. And to achieve that building of prosperity, we have defined our responsibilities as creating the conditions and opportunities for UK growth, securing more trade, investment, and jobs for the UK, and tackling global economic challenges, including low carbon growth. And our embassies have a mandate to help British companies win contracts, promote British sectoral strengths, and to understand and influence economic, financial, and political conditions in other countries. And they do this alongside their vital work of supporting global security. A G20 plus world is harder for people to navigate than a G8 world. 
Companies seeking to export for the first time or to break into new markets face obstacles, whether it's language, unfamiliar legal systems and local laws, or political risk and uncertainty. We want to do even more to help companies overcome that. And I'm pleased that many people in business are now reporting a cultural shift in the Foreign Office towards the more effective promotion of the British economy. Last year, the FCO and UKTI helped over 20,000 small and medium-sized enterprises to break into markets around the world. Last year, British exports of goods and services were up by 50 billion pounds, a double-digit rise of 11%, including significant increases to Brazil, Russia, and South Africa, and to China and India, which for the first time featured in our top dozen export destinations. The first Remimbi bond issued outside China was issued in London by a British bank. We signed a UK-US defense trade cooperation treaty that will make it easier for British firms to bid for US military contracts. Our consulates in Houston and Denver helped to prevent protectionist by American legislation. Our embassy and UKTI team in Riyadh helped Invensys secure a £420 million contract for rail signaling technology to help transport pilgrims between Mecca and Medina. And UKTI helped WS Atkins to use its Olympics cachet to win business overseas in countries such as Qatar, host of the 2022 FIFA World Cup. So across the globe, we're working to support you. And our, your president, Sir Roger Carr, addressed all our ambassadors in London uh, very recently. He told us that CBI members want greater assistance from our embassies in making contacts, deploying local knowledge, providing better coordination, and following up around ministerial business delegations. We've heard these messages, and we will strive to improve our performance in all these areas. We need you to tell the Foreign Office where you encounter difficulties and to contact us and let us know what more we can do to support you. And we need even closer cooperation and understanding between us on trends in the world and opportunities for prosperity. But from the beginning of the new government, we have embarked on expanding our diplomatic network so British diplomacy is present in more places with greater force and effectiveness. Our embassies are the essential infrastructure of our recovery overseas. So we are reversing the steady shrinking of Britain's diplomatic footprint under the last government. By 2015, we will have deployed 300 extra staff to fast-growing cities and regions in more than 20 countries, and we will have opened up to 11 new British embassies and eight new consulates or trade offices. For example, we will soon be one of only three countries in the EU to be represented in all the countries of ASEAN, with its new single market of 600 million people. We've already opened new consulates in Canada and Brazil. And my announcement yesterday of two new Deputy High Commissions in India mean that we will have more posts in India than any other diplomatic service in the world. And our ministers are relentless in promoting Britain overseas. We are passionate about helping to create jobs and growth and have already made more than 400, this is just the Foreign Office ministers, more than 400 separate visits to 127 countries, including many countries that have not seen a British minister in years or decades, honing in on opportunities for Britain as well as vital foreign policy issues. As I travel around the world, and I've been to 54 countries so far, I'm really proud of what we make and do in this country. We produce high-value goods and services in every sector, in every part of this country. We have the biggest industries in Europe for the life sciences, ICT, defense and security, and the financial services. The BBC's natural history programs are watched in 200 countries and territories. Doctor Who was the most downloaded show on iTunes in the United States last year. (laughs) We live in a country which, after centuries of buying fine wines and cognac from France, is now exporting to France. The French ambassador is here. We are exporting, <laughs> exporting to France five bottles of Scotch whiskey per second. <laughs> and, and as someone who worked with JCB, I also know that we've got some of the best engineering and manufacturing skills on earth. Well over a million cars a year are built in plants here in Britain, 70% of them for export, and around half our exports are manufactured goods. We have to do everything we can to make sure British people at home and abroad are aware of these things and to champion them ourselves, 
And we also have to protect our competitive advantage, so we're bringing forward guidance for business on how together we make our networks more resilient against cyber crime and cyber attack. So we have a government working to ensure that we have the most competitive tax system, the best education system, a revamped welfare system, and the most attractive environment to invest and start a business. We have a foreign office building the connections to the fast-growing economies of the world that will be indispensable to our future. We have ministers who lobby for British business on each and every visit overseas. We have the skilled diplomats increasingly on the ground able to interpret events, spot opportunities, make connections, and help you develop lasting relations. We have the determination to use our voice internationally to argue relentlessly for free trade and open markets and against protectionism or regulation that harms the British economy. With all this in place to support British companies, small and large, we now have to make the most of it so that British products are known by people in Brazil as well as they do in Belgium, in India as well as Ireland, in Southeast Asia as well as Western Europe. And we have to build on the spirit of adventure, determination, and invention that our country has always possessed, on which our success has been founded for so long, and without which no nation can succeed in the decades to come. As you do these things, British ministers and diplomats will be urging you on, backing you up, opening your way, and fighting your corner. In his speech to the Foreign Office, Sir Roger put it very well. He said, there is no doubt for business to be successful in an increasingly competitive world, it needs more courage, more effort, and more support than ever before. So the good news tonight is that you have a government that is determined to give you that support, and we look forward to working with you to bring the further success and prosperity that is within the reach of our country, our businesses, and our people. Thank you very much indeed.